Well, here's the big one that we've been promising you these past few days, mm. our interview with captain, leader, legend, as he was always called when he wore the number 26 jersey at Chelsea, John Terry. Yeah, looking forward to it very much. You'll love it. Um, he's very candid, very open, mm -hmm. talks about lots of things. Um, how he felt when he was walking up to take that penalty in Moscow. Yes, what was going through his mind, that's fascinating. Mm -hmm. uh, what he was thinking uh, when he kicked Alexi Sanchez mm -hmm. in the semi-final. Oh dear. Why, John? Why? Um, everything and, more, and, and why, by the way, he turned up in his, his kit. kit after they ultimately did go on mm -hmm. to win the European Cup in a game that he hadn't played in. So all of that and more with Chelsea's John Terry. We sat down last week and thoroughly enjoyed our conversation. We hope you do too. Uh, John, you're not the first uh, footballer, football coach, manager that we found in the kitchen this week. No. Um, it's, it, it seems it's, it's a very popular pastime cooking now. What are you preparing? I'm actually preparing a nice chilli tonight, so ah. a nice chilli with a salad. <laughs> oh, that's easy. But hold on. Is your sauce out a jar or are you making your own sauce? That's important. Oh, I'm out of a job, so I'm not that great. <laughs> yeah, mine too, JT. I did one the other night, exactly the same. Straight out of the jar. <laughs> it's a difficult time for everybody. What, what are you doing to stay busy? I think, I mean, as, a, as an ex-foot kind of football player and coach now, as well, I'm getting up pretty early most days. So I'm up kind of five or six. I go for a run. I'll get on the bike early. Uh, try and do a little bit of physical activity. Um, get that out of the way and I'm coming back and I just find there's chores that my wife has kind of found for me around the house so mopping the floors, clear, clearing the loft and, and a few other bits but just enjoying actually spending a bit of time with the kids which has been really nice. Yeah. How have you found that John? We've spoken to a few of the guys that have found it as a, an eye-opener having to spend 24 hours basically with the kids for the first time in their life over a sustained period. I mean, it's different, isn't it? <laughs> it's, it's, you know what, though? We're, we're lucky as well because obviously we kind of get to dip in and, and dip out and, yeah. and spend our time on the football pitch, uh, pitch and come home and, and stuff. So it's, um, it's been good for me because, like I said, it's, it's probably time we, we probably don't get to spend with our kids as well that, for those of us that have got kids out there. And, and kind of the weather's been really nice back home as well. Um, so it's been really good just to, to kind of really, you know, dissect, talk about stuff with, with them that's going on in their young lives as well. Yeah, it's funny how you say it. I, I, I mean, I think we're all in the same system to a degree. I'm up at five. I'm running by six. Are you? Yeah. I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm back in the house by uh, seven, half past seven. Yes. And, and then it's a question of the What's that, 12K run? Uh, uh, somewhere between 12 and 15, yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah, days, yeah. 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 JT does 12. I've caught, follow him on <laughs> Insta and I've seen him doing his runs, yeah. He's out there. He's out there. Now, listen, one thing, before, we, before we move on, John, one thing, most of the guys are doing certain things. They're doing jet washing. Are you a jet washer or not? I'm not a jet washer, actually. Ah. We're, uh, I'm lucky enough that a company comes in and does ah. that. So, uh, <laughs> That's my kind of guy, I tell you. I know a man who can, yes. I, sh I should have just lied, shouldn't I? Yes, you should have. Do my own jet washing. Are you keeping a very close watch on the boys? Yeah, between, between myself, the gaffer, and obviously Richard O'Kelly, um, we're in close contact with them. So they've been given their own programmes to kind of stay fit. And it's difficult, isn't it? Because we didn't know how long this was going to go on. So right mm. from the start, um, we had kind of bikes sent out to them and kind of, you know, dealing with those, uh, yeah. those individuals on a daily basis, making sure they're doing their work and, and how much they're doing. But also you don't want them to burn out as well. So again, it's very much led by the gaffer. So he's in, he's in full charge of that and probably having more of a, of a contact with the players than I mm. am. But just knowing that everyone's staying fit and kind of raring to go really once it's all, once we're, once we're given the green light. And how different is it for you now trying to ensure they're doing what has been asked of them and knowing that as a player you would probably looking to avoid doing the same things that they've got to now yeah it's difficult i mean there isn't too much to do anyway is there you know other than kind of <laughs> cook a chili and, and jet wash the back garden it's, uh, <laughs> there's not too much they can kind of get in trouble with at the moment but i think from from the player side i think like i think initially like a week or two weeks the players would have thought actually this is quite nice yeah Good. But then, then it kicks in like it does, you know, that you can't wait for summer to come as a football player. Mm. Summer arrives and two weeks into it, you think, I really want to get back. I miss <laughs> playing football. I miss what I love doing on a daily basis. And I think everyone's been in the same boat. So from that side of it, we've had great feedback from, mm. from the lads and, and their physical work that they're doing. But 
like I said, it's also that balance. You don't want them to work too hard now because when we go back, we'll probably have to do a mini pre-season and some physical mm. work as well just to get them up to speed again. How much, you, meant, you mentioned it there, you said the guys would miss playing football. How much are you missing playing football? Well, I don't think ever replace it. I really don't. No, I, I do. think I'm very lucky because I'm, I'm a coach and I'm on the football pitch on a daily basis. I think if I wasn't, yeah, I think I'd struggle, to be honest, with, mm. without that in my life. Mm. And you can see that, I mean, mental health's a big issue, isn't it, at the moment mm. that we're talking about. So I think this will give a, give a lot of players a taste mm -hmm. of, of what's to come when they're retired. Mm. It's not actually always greener on the other side. So it might just kind of be an opportunity for players to maybe kickstart their coaching careers, whether they be 20, 25, or, or really kind of think about what they want to do um, with, with their careers mm. after football. Mm. Let's take you back, if we may, to a time when Roman Abramovich didn't own Chelsea. <laughs> How much of a culture shock was it for everybody when that period started? Well, I think the culture shock, we, we was kind of bled in slightly easier, I think, because the, the quality of players and the personnel that we had pre-Roman, the likes of Zola, Dimato, Hullet, all, all, all those top players that arrived at the football club had kind of given Chelsea that wow factor. Mm. You know, with the, with the players we brought in, and now, albeit they was at the back end of their career, they were still some of the best players in the world, and yeah. probably Franco, without a shadow of a doubt, one of those. So we were very lucky. We had that kind of high profile uh, players in, in the building. So it wasn't too much of a culture shock. I think the, I think the combination of both Roman and then Mourinho coming in was was the was the big impact that I felt. Wow, this is we mean business here. What did you feel the first time you saw? The special one, John. What was your impression? The very first meeting, you sat down, all of you guys, and he stood in front of you for the first time. What was that like? Nerve wracking, and I was <laughs> petrified. <laughs> I think I, I think we'd all seen that uh, the interview that he'd done, where he kind of said, "I'm the special yeah. one." He just won the Champions League with Porto, and as a group of players, we were kind of texting, calling each other, going, "Oh no, this could be tough work." This, <laughs> but we went in from day one, and and he kind of blew us away with the sessions. Like all of us, you go in. Kind of going, okay. Let's see what the what the manager's got. Whether mm -hmm. that's a foreign manager, English manager, and it's down to them to deliver and impress you as a group of players. And he's certainly done that from day one. You know, he done that on a personal basis. He done that on the training field, and it was uh, he was very special. That's for sure. There's a magnetism, John. I don't need to tell you that. There's a magnetism about him. He was with us here recently before he got the Tottenham job. I don't look, don't look scared now, but this this actually would mm. do me for a chapter in the book. The day really? I the day I frightened JT. Oh, um, but, <laughs> but that would be a first. For the first time, he admitted publicly he was in the skip. Yes, he did. Ahead of the game against Barcelona. Now, now the, the the evening they came and played basketball, if you remember. Yes. I mean, um, what what was that dressing room like that night, and how how is it? How was it? that that tale didn't seep out for so long? I think if it was anyone else at the football club other than the manager, it would have seeped out. But I think everyone, honestly, everyone was so kind of scared of him <laughs> and respected him so much that he kind of never leaked out at all. Now, he obviously told you that he was in the skip and he yeah. had to be wheeled from the outside <laughs> around into the dressing room. But it's quite a long way at Chelsea. It is, yes. And he's like banging on, he's, he, he was banging on the skip trying to get out. He was desperate for a bit of air. But, but when he kind of come in, but again, him being him, he kind of, he was there, he jumped out and he was really delivered a, you know, a speech to us as well. And tactically, he was on point. It's just incredible, you know. But yeah, just a real surreal moment. But it, he never made us feel that he was in a skip, if that makes sense. He just made us feel that he was there watching what we was watching. Well, he, he, had, us, he had us in pieces because he yeah, said he at the end of the game, obviously, the UEFA officials were looking around for him and he said uh, it, was a, it was a metal skip, Metal wasn't skip, it? yeah. And he said yeah, yeah, the kit man yeah. left the, the, the lid half open and, 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 yeah. then, and then saw one of the UEFA officials and slammed it shut. <laughs> <laughs> and he, said, he was inside and couldn't breathe. <laughs> <laughs> but the thing is, he still come out of that skip looking a million dollars. Did you guys have any idea, John, when this skip was wheeled in and you're getting ready for arguably might have been the biggest game you've ever played together as a, as a group against Barcelona? And he goes, surprise! <laughs> Did any of you know he was coming out? 
we knew because he told us in the meetings and oh, stuff. Right. So it wasn't so much of a like a, a surprise and stuff like that. And we'd kind of come. And he was kind of there already. But you obviously he told us the stories after about he couldn't breathe and wanted yeah. to pop out and stuff like that. But yeah, he was kind of there, prepped and ready, kind of well before we got in. I think because I think the the UEFA officials were kind of hovering and expecting him to yeah. kind of be there. But again, he would go to to limits like that to you know to make sure that we had our manager with us. And again. It was, it was probably like a father figure. You just felt safe with him around. I noticed you, you, you said once he comes into his own when big games are played. What did you mean by that? Well, there was a couple of games. I think throughout the season as well, he was he was a manager that never kind of went into, and I don't want to sound too disrespectful here, but if we was playing Spurs or West Ham, or he wouldn't go into that game going, oh, we have to worry about these tactically that's set up with free midfield mm-hmm. and to cover this. He would go into them games expecting us as, as individuals and the football club to win that game and, and demand that we've done that. I think when we played the likes of Barcelona, Man City's on his second time round, he really showed this is a big game just by the approach throughout the week. So our approach throughout a normal week was all based on us and how we could break another team down. In those big games against the Barcelonas, the Man City's, all those by Munich, all of those games, we, we worked a hell of a lot on the mm. opposition and, and their strengths, how are they going to try and break us down. And tactically, it was something we didn't do. So when we dipped into it, it was like, wow, these must be a good team. And I think straight away that got our backs up to go, like, these mm. are coming to Stamford Bridge. These, these think they've got a chance of winning. OK. And it just pushed everyone onto that other level, made us more aware, I don't know. But again, he just had the, the quality as a, as a manager to deal with his sessions, but tactically and emotionally, he could deliver that side of it as well. Who got fed up with Didier? I wanted to ask you this for ages. When Didier first arrived and he was playing for you guys, and he used to throw himself all over the place, and if his shorts were ripped, he would be thrown about the floor. There's a story that goes around that you guys took him indoors and said, Didier, we don't do that here. Sort yourself out. Is that true? Not pretty much like that. I think we just carried on kicking him, trying <laughs> to get him out there. <laughs> that was it. But <laughs> the story, John, is that that you particularly may have had a quiet word with him, and Jose mm. said, "No, no, I, I like that. That's all part of 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 playing a football match. Mm. That's all part of trying to win a football match. True or not true?" Yeah. Yeah, he was. I mean, like all of us as well. If 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 you kick Didier and he'd kind of be on the floor then you'd have a pop, you know, saying that I haven't kind of kicked you or hardly touched you. And that could be me or could be someone else. But Mourinho see it from the other side of going, no, stay down, get players booked. <laughs> yeah. you'd, go, you'd, you'd go into games of going, um, you know, three weeks ahead, we'd be playing, I don't know, Man United. And all of a sudden, Rio would get booked on TV and he'd go, he's two away from suspension for our game. He wow. knew absolutely everything. Wow. And, and there's a group of individuals as well. He would tell us to... If, if I was on free bookings and we had the FA Cup come in the first round of the FA Cup against somebody in the lower leagues, he would say to me, right, next two league games, get suspended, miss that one, <laughs> you'll be back for the league game. It just kind of kicked. But all those, all those little bits. But that's he was planning. Like four steps, yeah. four steps. Ahead. That is planning. But he was four steps ahead of everyone, and it was, it was a part of the game that, that's obviously come in. Let me take you back to a very wet and windy night in Moscow. Oh, oh well done. Sorry about this, John. Ball <laughs> under your arm. What are you thinking yeah. as you walk to the spot? And did you know, as it left your foot, it was missing? Yeah, I pretty much did, to be fair, because I'd, I'd slipped. And on the, on the build-up to, to us, obviously, on the build-up to finals, you take penalties and you go through the routines and you do the walk from the halfway line. So I've been doing that for weeks, kind of two weeks now at the training ground and I'd, I'd been dinking them down the middle like the Penenka. No. No, no you're of, a centre-back. No, Get no. off. No, no chance. I know. <laughs> well, I, I wish I would have now. But I'm standing there and I'm like, you know, I'm thinking to myself, do I, don't I? And the lads are going, no, you just got to kind of, you know, smash it down the middle. Yeah, it's obviously a big regret of mine. I'm very thankful that we went on the 2000 as well when we managed to do it. Yeah, that was my third Champions League memory. I was going to run past you. As, as you nibbled Alexi Sanchez, did you know at that point that's my night over? Yeah, I knew, I knew I was in trouble, yeah. <laughs> it, it's funny because I heard before before we played him at Stamford Bridge, he got a dead leg. I was watching the game in, uh, in, in the league game, he got a dead leg on his right side, I think. And in the home game, he ran past me. And I kind of blocked him and caught him on his leg, and he was in absolute agony. 
and he, he kind of was still carrying it. So I thought, I'm just going to give him a little stupid, really. I don't know why. I, I don't know why I done the second one at the new camp because it put the team in, in a dreadful position. And I look back now and think, oh, that was a, probably one of my silliest moments. I think, yeah, as, as a player on the pitch, and it's, you know. A, if you could, you could pick one team you do not want to be down to ten men against. It would be Barcelona at New Camp. But so you were having another, some, you were having a, a nibble, an injury he already had then. Yeah, he had a dead leg, and he said he wouldn't get away with it today. But I thought I could get away with it back then. But uh -huh. I'm still not sure the lines can see it. I think he's just flagged because he's gone down. But it's called um, instinct, yeah. John. You think of those things, and they just yeah. happen, don't you? You don't think because if you had have done, you wouldn't have done it. Been there. No, you yeah. mean, John, I, I'm sitting with a guy that cost himself two years of his international career with a with a, a rush of blood. Briefly tell John what happened. Well, it wasn't quite as subtle as John. I mean, I, I, in Czechoslovakia, I got done by a guy called Anton Ondras, a big centre-back who played for the Czech Republic. And he, he yeah. halved me in two, John, on the halfway line when the ball was nowhere near us. And I jumped up. Mm -hmm. I was only 19. And I thought, nobody's looking. And I jumped up and stuck one on him, right chin, right cross, right on the chin. I thought, beautiful. <laughs> Down he went. <laughs> Next minute, the linesman's got his flag up like this. And I got sent off. And my mother, my mother was watching live. And she destroyed me when I got home. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so it happens. It, it happens. It happens. It happens to the very best. Of all the things that you've won, what's Ooh. the most satisfying? It would be. It's funny because I get asked that question probably the most um, since I've retired and it would have to be the Champions League I know I didn't play in the game but just the disappointment that I feel like I let the supporters down I feel like I let my teammates down in 2008 to get that opportunity to go back uh, when probably all odds was against us to be honest that year Yeah, yeah. in, in the year we had change of manager um, free run down away at Napoli um, down to 10 minutes in the new camp against Barca and just to do it was something that I can I can die a happy man because that's all I wanted to see in my lifetime as a Chelsea player and it's something that we wanted so much I think when you look back 2010 when Barcelona scored in the last minute scored a goal when we should have had a few penalties oh, remember it well we we probably wasn't at our strongest in 2012 for me we was better in you know 2010 2004 mm. 5 2005 6 but that's the way it is and that's probably why it's the hardest trophy to win you got some terrible stick for joining the celebrations. Please clear this up for me. I was told in order for you to be part of the post-match celebration, you had to be stripped. You had to be in kit. True or not? Yeah, I, I do get a lot of stick for this, and, and that is true. So UEFA, I think they, they had it uh, when Man United won it, or Juventus won it one year, when the kind of Man United players were standing there in their suits. It didn't look right. So UEFA had kind of emailed both clubs asking whoever goes on to win the trophy, just make sure players are there in full kits. Now, I, I must admit, I was on pretty sharpish in my full kit. <laughs> <shin pad laughs> a lot, but, <laughs> but he was out, so, yeah, I'll take it on the chin, it's fine. <laughs> but in fairness, I don't think anybody would not have done, given that no. opportunity. You're part of it. Of course you are. You? So you want to be in amongst it. Absolutely, 100%. But it was, it was a yeah. UEFA request, and anybody celebrating needs to look like he's played in that game. Yeah, they do. And they still do the same today. I think I think it's just still the same rules and stuff, which I think is right because a lot of players that were left out that's, that night, I mean, myself, Ivanovic, Ramirez was suspended. Yeah. Um, I mean, Ivanovic was on the crossbar, if you remember right. Yes, kind he, of, he doesn't get any stick. It's just all, I'll take the brunt of it. But <laughs> like I said, I'll take that all day long. <laughs> uh, they always say oh, the, the, the first one that you win is most special. So it's interesting to hear you say yeah, that. I thought you might say your first title. I thought you might say the first Premier League title, John. I really did. It's a, um, yeah. uh, so it, it, it's a it's a tough one because obviously that's the the kind of the pinnacle, isn't it? Yeah. That first one, like you're saying. But I just think, and and even I didn't play in the final of the Champions League. I think for that one to see to see the players, the supporters, and kind of the messages you get and the letters you get from supporters after that, the experiences that you know, even even silly things about parents passing away between those four years and. I wish my dad could have seen it. It's all of those bits you go. Mm. Chelsea Football Club means so much to our supporters and to see them so happy just makes me happy. Mm. You see, that's actually not silly. I understand that totally. Uh, and is there anything that you look back on and think, I, I wish I'd done that? Yeah, not kicked him. <laughs> <laughs> no, aside from that. Um... 
it's it's difficult because it go it goes so quick, doesn't it? You know, so it's it's one of them. I, I mean, I was I was probably a kind of knee jerk player, if that makes sense, and very reactive to things, but not 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 particularly. No, I wouldn't say so. I gave it my all every day in training, and I think that's kind of what made me uh, being the way I trained and, and and kind of went out there every day. You know, Chelsea was my club from the age of fourteen, and to kind of feel what the supporters felt on a weekly basis. So if we lost the game, I would go home and feel what they felt, you know, we'd cancel, cancel dinners and stuff. So it just meant so much to me. It's, it's, it's really difficult to say, but I gave everything for the football yeah. club and I feel like when I left it, I left it in a better place. Conversation we had the other day, John, Andy and myself, I was talking to him about leaders, mm. how important somebody such as yourself is or was in a dressing room. Do you think there are the same number of big characters now that there once was? Um, and if, if the answer is no, why is that? For me, the answer is no. I'm not sure why that is. Are we kind of taking and not giving players enough responsibility? Are we giving players too much responsibility? Are we as managers, the first thing managers do when they go into a team is they go, I want that leader, I want that captain. That leader or captain might not be there. So you're then forcing it on somebody that maybe doesn't want it, isn't comfortable being the way you want him to be. Mm. And I think as, as a manager, I think it's important that first and foremost that you lead and you lead by example. And I think if, if you do that, I think if you have the players, then the players will follow or the right players, they will follow. Um, yeah, it, it's a difficult one, but it's, it's an interesting topic, isn't it? Yeah, it's fascinating for me because I think it, it, in, in, in maybe softening the game, we've, we've, we've taken the leadership out of the game, if you follow what I'm saying. Yeah, 100% agree. And I think now as well, I think we look now, and we, a lot of football clubs, there's leadership groups of four or five players. I think as well, within our time, we never called it a leadership group, I'm sure. No. You know, back in the, but, but you, you had a leadership group without being a leadership group, if that makes sense as well. So you have players doing the right thing on a daily basis. And if you've got the likes of Peter Cech, Ashley Cole, Didier Drogba, Frank Lampard, the players that are turning up week in, week out, putting in the best performances, staying behind after training, turning up early. So when training starts at 10.30, turning up at 10.15. So the real basics and principles of, of doing the things right the way. When you've got players that are not playing in that team, trying to get in front of Frank and Ash and Peter Cech and Didier, and they're not doing what they're doing, they have no chance, but them leaders lead by example, and that happens on a daily basis. It's interesting yeah, it you does. mention Ashley. There's somebody else that's had a lot of stick during his career, yeah. and yet talk to people that played with him, and he always gets a mention as having done all of the right things all of the time. Ashley Cole, the best left back in, in world football for me, one of the best professionals that I've come across in the game. Yes, like all of us, like tonight out after a good win or a good victory, but I have to say, probably one of the most personal and um, well-mannered boys that you could kind of ever ask mm -hmm. for. Mm -hmm. And even even still now, my, my kids ask about um, two people from the football club, ask about Mourinho and Ashley Cole. You know, we haven't seen Ashley for a while. He would give them so much time. There'd be things that would happen with members of family uh, within the, the, the kit staff, the kitchen staff. And Ash would be the first one to go right. and contribute or make sure that that family mm. was sorted. And, and again, the press don't want to don't want to print stories of course like not. that. No, they don't. Just a, just just a, a top top guy, as I'm sure you all it's know. Too good a story. Yeah. Too, good news doesn't make headlines, John. That's the problem with that. That's the problem. No, exactly. John, we feel privileged to have spent this time with you, and can't thank you enough. Uh, I, I could stay here all night, but uh, I know you have other demands. Yes. So um, we we can only thank you again and uh, look forward perhaps to spending more time with you going forward. And don't burn the mints Absolute tonight. Pleasure. Don't burn the mints, OK? <laughs> just a quick, just a quick see Good lad. <laughs> really nice to see Cheers, you guys. John. Right? Cheers, John. Great to see you. Thank see you. Later.